Hello travelers, and welcome to Sandman's Talks, a series of videos where guides from across the network take a closer look at a specific topic. In this video, I'm going to answer a single question. How did Germany transform itself from complete destruction in 1945 into the global economic superpower we see on the world stage today? My name is Max and I've been working as a guide with Sondemans in the city of Berlin for the past three years now. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments section down below. And if you enjoy the video, feel free to like and subscribe. It really makes a big difference. Well, let's get started. Imagine we're in Berlin. It's 1945. Now, sustained Allied bombing had destroyed the entire city and almost all of the other cities across Germany. The manufacturing centers, the industrial hubs, they're all gone. And on top of the destruction, a huge cloud of shame and guilt hangs above the nation. Nobody that was there in 45 could have predicted the speed and the scale of the economic recovery. It was about to happen. And today, Germany has become the engine of the European Union. You know, Germany only has 1% of the world's population, and yet somehow it's responsible for 10% of the world's exports. The numbers are mind-boggling. If I had to use a single word to describe this transformation, I'd use diversification. Now, some of the changes were because of calculated plan, and some of the changes uh, were because of luck. But at its core, I really believe that this transformation was because of geographic, political, and economic diversification. Let's take a look at Berlin before the war. In the 1920s and in the 1930s, Berlin was like most of the other major cities in the world. It was an industrial center and a banking center, the manufacturing center. Everything was in one place. It was like London or Paris or New York. So when Berlin gets completely wiped out, it's not just the destruction that's the problem. Because Berlin, like the German nation itself, gets invaded and occupied by foreign militaries. And then divided up into sections. The British, French, and American sector, that becomes the West. The Soviet sector, that becomes the East. And Berlin is sitting right there in the middle of the East. So West Berlin becomes this strange capitalist island in the middle of this sea, this red ocean of communism. Now imagine you owned a factory in West Berlin. What are you going to do? You're going to start shipping supplies in through the Soviet Union into West Berlin, manufacture your product there, and then ship it back past the communist sector into West Germany? That's impossible. So business leaders decide that instead of rebuilding their factories in Berlin, they'll just build them in West Germany. Everybody leaves and sets up shop in a new location. Siemens and Allianz head down to Munich. The financial sector goes to Frankfurt. The publishing sector goes to Hamburg. On and on, down, down the list we go. Now, if you watch the news or listen to politicians talk these days, you'll hear people use the phrase wealth distribution a lot. Wealth distribution, it's not just about who has the money. It's also really important where is the money. And by the late 1940s, because it was spread out, Germany had become one of the most geographically diverse nations on the planet Earth. And the people in charge of West Germany, the first chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, working hand in hand with his finance minister, uh, a guy by the name of, of Ludwig Erhard, they put together a plan. They chart a course for the future. And they say the competition in the free market system is going to be the best way to achieve and maintain uh, safety and security. They put the 
control in the hands of the business leaders. And the central government would just be there to provide a, a safety net in case, in case anything went wrong. They take the decision-making power from the central government and they spread it out to the local governments, to the business leaders, to the labor unions. They diversify the politics and they'd already diversified the geography. They're ready to go. There's just one thing one thing holding them back, uh, they didn't have any money. Now, across the Atlantic in the United States, the Americans are increasingly worried that history is about to repeat itself. Because remember, after World War I, the wave of economic and political crises that swept through Europe were directly responsible for the rise in extremist violent leadership. We didn't just get Hitler in Germany. We also got Mussolini in Italy, we got Franco in Spain, we got Stalin in Russia. The Americans are terrified this is going to happen all over again. So they start a plan. It's called the European Recovery Program, the ERP. Most people refer to it as, as the Marshall Plan. They're going to take $12 billion, use it to reconstruct Europe, use it to eliminate trade barriers, use it to stop the spread of communism. And if somewhere along the way they happen to create a giant market for American products, uh, they're not going to be too worried about that either. At the beginning, American politicians, European politicians, they're passionately opposed to any of this money going to Germany. And after the Second World War, well, that's completely understandable. But by 1947, that's already starting to change. President Truman is, is looking at a communist revolution in beginning in Greece. Great Britain, they don't have the resources anymore to provide aid to the continent. Truman says you can't separate Germany from Europe. You can't help one without the other. And as the fear of communism grows ever larger, they decide that a fully recovered Germany is essential for global security. And what the Germans refer to as the Wirtschaftswunder where the global economic miracle really begins. They take off. So by the time the Berlin Wall falls on the 9th of November, 1989, by the time the wall comes down, West Germany has become the third largest economy on the planet Earth. And it's because of that that the West Germans are able to finance a reunification with the East. In the first two decades of the unification process, West Germany pays 2 trillion euros, or 100 billion euros a year, for East German redevelopment. Now, if you're going to spend 100 billion euros a year, you want to make sure you put the money in the right places. And what are the right places? To answer that question, the Germans just had to turn around and look at their recent past. Because in an 80-year period, in a single human lifetime from 1910 to 1990, the Germans had tried just about every form of, of government, of politics, of economics that the humans have come up with. In 1910, it was a colonial monarchy. It was a, 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 an empire with, with Kaiser Wilhelm II in charge. That was followed by a failed democracy in the Weimar Republic. And then came a fascist military dictatorship with central control over everything under Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists. And finally, you had two systems at the same time. In West Germany, it was the social market economy. And in East Germany, it was a communist state with public control over all of the industry and a centrally planned economy. When the dust settled in the 1990s, the Germans just had to look at history and, and choose things that work and mix it all together. They said we should have some competition. We'll take some capitalism and sprinkle some Marxism on top of it. It sounds crazy, but it was actually a terrific idea. You know, in the modern German system, the business owners and the labor unions actually work together. Did you know in Germany, the labor unions, their representatives have seats on the board of directors of the businesses? Let's take a look at Siemens, for example. They're the largest industrial manufacturer in Europe. Their headquarters is down in Munich. Their board of directors has 20 seats. Ten of them 
are for shareholders' representatives, and 10 of them are for union representatives. When they make a decision, not just on wages or working conditions, but if they make a decision on whether to launch a new product, what market to launch that product into, if they're going to open a new factory, where they're going to open a new factory, everyone is involved in making that decision. And that unparalleled level of openness, uh, communication, it leads to a high level of something economists refer to as social trust. Social trust is when everyone in society, from the people on the bottom to the people on the top, they all believe that the system is there to benefit them. Nations that are really high in social trust are inevitably really good at dealing with unforeseen disasters. We're going to finish today by taking a look at how the German system responded to the 2008 financial crisis. The American stock market collapsed. It triggered a worldwide recession. You couldn't borrow money, and if you were holding a debt, you were completely wiped out. Now, because the German economy was geographically diversified, this meant the crisis was spread out across the whole nation. That naturally lessened the blow to begin with. And then because it was politically diversified, and much of the power lay in the hands of local governments, the people on the ground could make decisions based on what they were seeing in their specific location. And on top of it all, the high level of social trust and the fact that union representatives have seats on the board of directors meant that workers were going, willing to take massive pay freezes. They agreed to huge reductions in working hours to avoid massive layoffs. So when the recession ended, the German businesses didn't have to go out and hire new workers. They were already fully staffed with highly trained employees, and the recovery happened at lightning speed. I'm not here to tell you that the German system is perfect or it's a utopian society. Far from it. Those things don't exist, and, and they never will. But it is remarkable to sit here now in 2020 and to look back at the remarkable progress and the decisions that made that progress possible in the last 75 years. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming. I hope you learned something. And if you'd like to keep learning, if you want to investigate this topic further, I recommend a book called Post-War. It's by an author named Tony Judd, J-U-D-T. It goes in-depth into European Reconstruction after 1945. Not just Germany. He looks at, he looks at everything. Now, if I was going to be a guide in another city, not just Berlin, I'd probably have to pick Munich down in Bavaria in the south. Beautiful, beautiful city. It's my wife's hometown. And if I could do any tour in Munich, uh, hands down, it's got to be the, uh, the beer tour. Go to ancient breweries, see how they make it, try the different beers, and do a beer tour in the land of beer, the home of the Oktoberfest. That's, that's where you got to do it. If you... If you have any questions for me, leave it down in the comments feed if you enjoyed the video. Remember, don't forget to like and subscribe. Now, if you could take a minute to consider what the video was, was worth, what this experience was worth for you, there's a donation button down below. It, it really makes a big difference and allows us to continue to make these videos. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourself. I had fun. And hopefully, later on, I'll, I'll see you in Berlin. Bye.